Good morning. Today, I would like to start a conversation about words. Specifically, the words we use to talk about mental illness, which is both common and serious. An estimated 26% of American adults, or about one in four, will experience being diagnosed with a mental disorder in any given year. One in 17 will be diagnosed with what's termed a serious mental illness, such as depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Teens with mental illness are more likely to drop out of school and be in the juvenile justice system. Adults with mental illness are more likely to be homeless, more likely to be incarcerated, more likely to die early, an average of 25 years earlier than their mentally well peers, usually due to treatable medical conditions. Despite how serious these conditions can be, last year only about 60% of adults and 50% of kids ages 8 to 15 actually got the treatment that they needed. This is due to many reasons. Services simply aren't available in some areas, and many people can't afford them. But the number one barrier to obtaining mental health treatment, according to a national survey, is stigma. The words that we use. And this is where I want to talk about the words that we use to talk about mental illness. The media often model this for us, and not always very well. Here's some recent examples. I think we can agree that these are not especially helpful. Now, we used different words in the past. As a historian of colonial America, I know that our ancestors in the 1600s and 1700s talked about having mental illness as being distracted. At first, this sounds pretty gentle, as if they were saying the person was simply spacing out a little bit, not paying attention. Or maybe it suggests some danger, if distracted suggests distracted driving to you. Or maybe even humor, if the word distracted inevitably makes you think of that squirrel-obsessed dog from the movie Up. But the meaning of the word distracted is to pull apart, or pull off track, distract. And the Puritans were all about being on track. They believed in predestination, the idea that God had chosen a path for each individual before they were even born. To be distracted meant you were off that path of godly living. You know who else was off the path of godly living in Puritan New England? Witches. I think we know how things worked out for them. Now maybe we can borrow some words from the way that we talk about physical illnesses. If you have heart disease, for example, you can learn about how to fight heart disease. You can even read about the superfoods that will help you beat heart disease. We talk about fighting cancer, too. And here the words get even more militaristic as we talk about battling cancer. This goes back to at least 1971, when President Richard Nixon signed into law the National Cancer Act, which allocated federal funds for research. He designated it a war on cancer. Now, we use the words fight and battle to talk about bipolar disorder as well, and depression. But, and we talk about it in regards to a lot of chronic illnesses and conditions. One of the few exceptions I found was how we talk about erectile dysfunction. There we tend to use words like deal with, suffer from, treat the symptoms. And I guess if we were to have a war on erectile dysfunction, it would be difficult to know exactly who or what the enemy might be. In any case, we do hear the words fight and battle in reference to depression and bipolar disorder, but we don't have a war on depression and bipolar disorder. And it's certainly rare to hear talk, someone talk about fighting or beating these diseases, except for Englishman Frank Bruno, who says about having bipolar disorder, I am going to fight it, not let it beat me. Of course, Frank Bruno is a former heavyweight boxing champion of the world, so perhaps it makes quite a lot of sense for him to use the words of fighting and battling to describe his experience. Frank Bruno has also become an advocate for ending the stigma around mental illness. 
because he knows it makes it more difficult for people who have it to seek the treatment that they need, especially middle-aged men like himself. So clearly the language of fighting, fighting and battling is useful for some people. Moreover, it might be helpful in helping those without mental illness understand the true severity of these conditions. We all experience sadness, of course, but anyone with clinical depression will emphasize that it is an entirely different phenomenon from our daily disappointments and even our serious sorrows. As, Nat as blogger Natasha Tracy writes, language is the problem. No one euphemistically says, gosh, I feel so cancer-ridden today. But we will say, I'm so depressed, my favorite sports team lost last night. So maybe when a heavyweight boxer describes having bipolar disorder as his toughest fight, tougher even than facing Mike Tyson in the ring, it helps everyone else understand just how difficult, frightening, and dangerous these conditions can be. There are other words, of course, as evidenced by a recent Twitter campaign, when I think of mental illness. It's inspired thousands of creative responses, such as, when I think of mental illness, I think that it's not a flaw of character, it's a flaw in chemistry. Meanwhile, the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, an organization for which I am a peer advocate, has recently launched a simple two-word campaign to help people with mood disorders connect with the support that they need. I'm here. Others have gone even further, suggesting that there are benefits to having depression. Newspaper headlines have read that mild and moderate depression may be good for us. It may even leave you more resilient and creative. Some are quick to dismiss these claims as naive, wishful thinking. As Dr. Carol Lieberman says, I don't believe there are benefits to having depression. It's like saying there are benefits to having a heart attack. If you don't die, you can get the treatment you lead, need and live a healthier lifestyle, but surely it'd be preferable not to have the heart attack in the first place. Dr. Lieberman's point is very well taken, but there is actually some evidence that people with depression can perform better than their non-depressed peers on some mental tasks. A recent journal article has suggested that depression can promote analytical reasoning and persistence. Others have held links between depression and focus, attention, memory, and creativity. Some researchers even believe that while depression can be dangerous, even fatal to some sufferers, it is so profoundly powerful in influencing our thoughts and behavior that it actually has served evolutionary adaptation. It's contributed to the survival of our species. Meanwhile, other researchers are looking at potential benefits to having bipolar disorder. One recent article concludes that people with bipolar disorder are more reactive to rewards and goals in their lives. They will work harder towards such goals, much longer than, quote, normal people. Other investigators are finding links between depression, between bipolar disorder and creativity, leadership, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Now, none of these scientists is suggesting that having a mental illness is all unicorns and glitter. In fact, they warn that the temperament and leadership styles of passionate leaders can facilitate outstanding success or predispose to catastrophic failure, depending on how they address the condition. Which brings me back to my original point about words. The words that we use and the way in which they can affect our thoughts and behavior. I don't have the words for you today, but I have confidence that you all can come up with them. Any society with the linguistic creativity to turn fail into a noun, an adult into a verb, that can contract I am going to into I'm a, and name a band LMFAO, surely has a linguistic creativity to come up with the words that will help. Thank you.